sexual harassment uh, is a way of reducing their power, of treat them as a sexual object. And so this means that they are their power because they are treating the male uh, structure of power and the stereotypical patriarchal structure of power that we have in our labor market. So we have to, I mean, look also the structure of power because give us a lot of uh, different elements uh, for contrasting uh, sexual harassment and for contrasting all these different types of sexual harassment that uh, we saw in our labor market and in our reality. I'm Giulia Zacchia from Sapienza University of Rome. I'm a feminist economist and I'm proudly member of Minerva Lab, that is a laboratory on diversity and gender inequality in Sapienza University of Rome. Uh, the Twitter Me Too campaign uh, uh, that we also started in 2017, of course, I mean, show us how Per, uh, pervasive was and is today uh, sexual harassment uh, in all countries of the world, in all economic sectors. But let me say, let me stress that looking at sexual harassment, the main problem that we have as researchers is to quantify this problem. Because, I mean, mainly the first I mean, <laughs> main problem that we have is that we don't still have a clear universal, unique definitions of sexual harassment and what sexual harassment mean. And so this means that also for collecting data on the phenomena, we will not have I mean, data that are comparable all around the world. And another problem that we have for the quantification of, the, of, of this problem, of this phenomenon, is that we have a normalization of violence. A normalization of violence means that a lot of women that experience this phenomena do not recognize that as sexual harassment. They don't target that as unwanted sexual abuse, unwanted sexual attention that they have in their workplaces. So, for example, uh, what we found, uh, and uh, when I say we, because me and my co-author, Itza Skonzuazu, uh, looking at the European context and looking at the data for uh, Europe, we found out that just the 3% of women that has an interview that work in the formal labor market in Europe. The just, I mean, saying that ha they have experienced uh, sexual harassment or any, I mean, sexual attention in the workplaces in the 12 months before the interviews has been conducted. There is also huge heterogeneity among the different countries, but I mean, consider that the Mediterranean countries, and so, I mean, one of the countries where I come from, Italy, uh, are those who have the lower level of uh, uh, women that, uh, I mean, are saying that uh, are experiencing sexual harassment in their workplaces than the northern European countries. And you can imagine that one of the reasons of these differences is that we have different level of uh, knowledge about this phenomenon. And more all, uh, we have different social norm that acts in our society. And of course, in Mediterranean countries, we have patriarchal structures of all uh, dimensions and also of the workplaces. So let me say that uh, these uh, official statistics are just a tip of uh, an iceberg of these, of all the quantification of this problem, of this uh, phenomena. But I mean, still, we deserve to analyze, as we did, this little, I mean, uh, uh, share of uh, data that that we have to define uh, which are the cost. When we speak about sexual harassment, we used to think about, I mean, the top-down situation, so the top-down sexual harassment, where uh, the male manager used to harass uh, um, uh, the uh, female subordinates. But we have different kinds of uh, sexual harassment. We have the horizontal one that takes place uh, between peers, but we have also another form uh, that is the bottom up sexual harassment. This means that uh, female managers are harassed by uh, the male um, subordinates. And a lot of uh, the, uh, social, uh, the um, uh, sociological literature is uh, going to analyze and, is, and has already analyzed uh, this latter term of uh, sexual harassment, so the bottom-up uh, sexual harassment. And it's 
really interesting because they find out that uh, women in top position have higher, are at higher risk of sexual harassment, are more target of sexual harassment, and this because they treat the male power in uh, the workplaces, in the uh, labor market, and uh, this means also to treat the patriarchal structure of uh, power that we have uh, in uh, the formal labor market. And uh, that's why, I mean, we think that uh, we should analyze also on the economic perspective these uh, different kind of uh, sexual harassment, introducing some uh, analysis on the structure and gender structure of power in our formal labor market, for example, considering occupations or considering uh, the gender compositions of uh, workplaces where I mean, women are working. And the impact uh, um, of women that are target of sexual harassment uh, are, I mean, of different kind. Of course, I mean, uh, they are affected by uh, health problems, by identity problems. Uh, they also reduce uh, the well-being. Uh, I mean, psychological, physical, but also um, uh, in terms of their career. So they have problem in their uh, career path. And this, of course, affects also negative their wages. But still, on the economic spheres and uh, economic research, I mean, is doing, I mean, not a lot for integrating and to looking deeply in uh, these effects that sexual harassment can have on wages. There are uh, uh, some different theories that try to define the relationship between the wages and the risk of sexual harassment in the workplaces. Uh, most of all, I mean, uh, a strand of the literature tends to find a positive relationship between the sexual harassment risk and the wages, applying uh, a sort of wage premium, so a sort of increase in wages uh, due to the fact that uh, sexual harassment is considered an extremely negative working condition. So like, uh, I mean, an increase in the risk of injuries or an increase in the risk of death that we can have in our labor market. So um, we have have a wage compensation uh, uh, theory that tend to find out these positive relationships. And it's something that has been experienced and found also for the United States, where uh, some studies found uh, a, re a positive relationship uh, uh, between uh, sexual harassment risk and the wages of, of women. Uh, because, I mean, women that used to work in workplaces with a higher uh, risk of sexual harassment uh, I mean, uh, time to have uh, a wage premium, so a compensation in wage. But this is true just for white women. While for, for example, for non-white non women, we don't find any compensation for these uh, worst conditions in the work mark in uh, in the workplaces, and so what we have tried to do, me and my colleague, we are trying to analyze the context of Europe, and so to see if uh, also in Europe we can speak about uh, a wage premium. Uh, connected with higher um, sexual harassment risk in the workplaces, or as we did, we can speak just about a risk of penalty. So a penalty in wages due to the fact that you work in a context at higher risk of sexual harassment. What we found uh, looking at the micro data uh, about the European conditions and for women employed in the formal labor market, we mainly find that uh, there is a statistically significant negative, negative uh, impact effect of uh, sexual harassment risk on wages. So meaning that I mean working in a, uh, in a workplaces at higher risk of sexual harassment decrease the wage wages of uh, women. But this impact is particularly negative uh, for um, high-skill women and for high-skill female workers. And most of all, for those women that we can call so in a high position, so white collar, high-skill uh, female workers. And this is something that was particular 
I mean, uh, intense. And uh, we wanted to investigate it a little bit more, looking also at the structure of uh, uh, these workplaces where these uh, high-skill women are working. So we uh, framed three different scenarios. One where, I mean, uh, these women uh, tend to uh, work uh, in, uh, uh, in a workplace is characterized by a high level of uh, men, so mainly, mainly, <laughs> mainly men that held a high position uh, in, in the workplaces and uh, workplaces where we have more women in uh, top hierarchical positions and the workplaces where uh, we have a gender balance in the top management. And what we found once more is that uh, sexual harassment risk, of course, has a negative effect and reduce uh, the wage premium for those women for working in higher hierarchical positions, but most of all, I mean, this negative effect is uh, experienced by women that uh, used to work in male-dominated uh, workplaces, in uh, workplaces where we have a concentration of men in top position. For Europe, uh, we can say, I mean, safely, uh, that we don't have a wage compensation effect for sexual harassment, but uh, that uh, instead uh, it's not a wage premium, but it's the wage penalty, the risk, uh, uh, the sexual harassment and the sexual harassment risk in the workplaces for women working in the formal labor market. And and most of all, I mean, we can interpret that as uh, the fact that um, the uh, women that uh, used to work in the counter uh, stereotypical uh, workplaces, and uh, this means, of course, uh, working in higher top positions, but also in a context where we have more male and more masculinized uh, workplaces, they are more penalized uh, on that. So the interpretation is that, on one sense, I mean, a sexual harassment risk can increase the gender pay gap at the European level, because we analyze, of course, the, um, the, the data about the European labor market. But, uh, I mean, looking at the second part, so uh, this uh, um, treat, uh, this power treat effects that we can uh, find for, I mean, women in the top uh, positions, we can say that uh, sexual harassment is an extra cost for uh, women and, uh, I mean, uh, a way to discourage them uh, to enter in top higher position and uh, top hierarchical position in the labor market, but also in the male-dominated sectors in the labor market. So this means once more, not only an increase in gender pay gap, but also an increase in gender segregation in the labor market. That could be, of course, vertical and horizontal. Sexual harassment, uh, of course, uh, can be used, and this is something that comes also from the sociological um, uh, literature, can be seen as an equalizer. Meaning that, for example, for those women that work in the top hierarchical position that are mainly we say target of uh, sexual harassment, um, this uh, sexual harassment uh, is a way of reducing their power, of treat them as a sexual object. And so this means that they are their power because they are treating the male uh, structure of power and the stereotypical patriarchal structure of power that we have in our labor market. So we have to, I mean, look also the structure of power because give us a lot of uh, different elements uh, for contrasting uh, sexual harassment and for contrasting all these different types of sexual harassment that uh, we saw are <laughs> in our labor market and in our reality. And we are all part of that, uh, absolutely, also for the economist uh, and in our profession. I mean, the policies and, uh, and the, the consequences uh, uh, are different. Uh, are different. Uh, of course, I mean, we cannot uh, uh, try to find one solution and, of course, suggest some education for male manager. I mean, it's, yes, could be, I mean, one part and one little part of these stories, but we saw that we have different kind of uh, uh, sexual harassment. There is also this bottom-up sexual harassment. So we have to consider 
broadly, we have to consider the complexity of this uh, aspect, also in policies. And so we have to broaden our definitions. And in that sense, I really think that what is missing is uh, data. So we should have a data collection, a better data collection that uh, will give us information about uh, sexual harassment, first of all, working conditions, um, the pay status and the pays of uh, the people that are working in our formal labor market. And pay transparency and also working condition transparency is essential also for reducing the discrimination in the labor market, the gender discriminations. So having data about that, uh, I mean, will help us to monitor and to try to better and to try to reduce uh, uh, these aspects, this phenomenon, and also this gender discrimination. And I also, uh, let me say, think that uh, trade unions and all social dialogue infrastructures I mean, can be really supportive and can have a real impact on reducing and preventing uh, from sexual harassment in the workplaces because they voice uh, women's um, minorities and more vulnerable workers, giving them more bargaining power. So maybe a much more involvement of uh, I mean, social dialogue structures and trade unions will help us in this fight against sexual harassment.